yeah, I will uh, just wel welcome everyone to this session. Um, this is a, a panel. Oh, yes, Ramona is uh, just confirming that um, we can go ahead. Um, so, so welcome to this panel session on uh, the Campbell Aging Coordinating Group. And um, I'm uh, delighted to chair this session. My name is Vivian Welch. I'm Editor-in-Chief of the Campbell Collaboration. And I'm also one of the co-directors of uh, partnership uh, on uh, global aging between Cochrane and Campbell, uh, of which this is a part. Uh, Joe Thompson Kuhn is the co-chair of Campbell Aging. And um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome all the speakers today. Um, um, we uh, have four speakers, uh, three are here right now. Um, so I would like to uh, start with uh, Wenbo Qi uh, from Sichuan University, China. Uh, Wenbo will speak to us about internet use as a mediator between social participation and depression among middle and older adults, a cross-sectional study. Um, Wenbo Qi is uh, studying for a master's degree in the School of Public Health at Lanzhou University. And during her doctoral period, she is mainly engaged in the research of hospital performance management and human resource management. And um, with that, I'd like to welcome Wenbo to um, take the floor. I hope that you'll be able to share your screen. Sorry, uh, can I? Sorry. There, if one of us leaves, I think. Um, so there's only room for five screens. So I don't know, Elizabeth. Um, since you're the last speaker, could I maybe ask you to leave and come back? Will you be able to do that? Okay, so maybe now, Wenbo, you can share your screen. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, I, I can't share uh, screen. Hello. Oh, okay. It's working now, is it? One minute, one minute. Yeah. Okay. So there is a screen option uh, uh, just uh, next to the setting button. Just click on that. Yeah, right. So just uh, uh, click at F12 or full screen to display the full screen of the PPT. Okay, can you, can you? Okay. Now, Wenbo, but you can make your presentation on our screen. We can see the slides on the left-hand side right now. So if you go okay. to, uh, can you click F12 button? Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, today, the title of my research is Physical Mutability, Social Participation and Depression Among Older People in China. Um, as we all know, an increasing number of people entering old age is a problem faced by the whole world, um, especially in China. And the aging trend of China's population is expected to continue. Um, so it's, it's practical practice that by 2050, there will be 1.5 uh, billion people over 65 years old in the world. And China, uh, 65 years old, will reach about 400 million, um, of which the population over 80 years old will reach uh, will reach 150 million. Uh, the following two graphs are from the 2019 World Population Statistics and uh, uh, Projection released by the United Nations. So we selected the population to display, which can see the 
growing trend of the elderly population and the forecast trend in the future. Mm, therefore, in the face of this grim situation, we need to pay attention to a, a series of challenges, uh, of challenges brought about, uh, brought about by the aging of the population, such as the increase in the risk of dementia uh, and uh, hypertension, and so on. Mm, compared with patients with a single disease. Um, the management of medical needs of patients with multiple diseases is more complicated. So, uh, a, um, in addition, a series of effects on social and emotional functions also need to be considered. And one of the important risks is depression. So, we found in in our research, we found in developing countries, depression is a serious public health problem and uh, um, one of the three major diseases ca that cause disability. So, um, we, uh, besides, we noticed that another important variable that we noticed um, was social participation from a um, theoretical point of view, the positive uh, correlation between social participation and better health outcomes have, have been tested in some countries and regions, um, including China and uh, United States, Japan and Europe and some other countries. So uh, our research focuses on the relationship between uh, physical multimobility, social participation and uh, depression among the elderly in China. Um, and like the, the data selected from wave four of the China Health and the Retirement longi uh, Longitudinal Study, this database is a longitudinal study assessing the health, social and uh, economic status of um, nationally uh, samples which cover which cover 450 villages and uh, 150 counties in, in 28 provinces in China. So our, uh, the, the following is our uh, inclusion criteria as age um, 65 years old and above and any other. Um, next is about uh, statistical analysis. Well, there are some there are some of the statistical methods that we used. Um, I think that's uh, some tips uh, in our research. And, and next is the is about the result. Uh, ultimately, six more than sixteen uh, more than six thousand subjects were enrolled, and about uh, fifty. 50 Male and age from to seventy uh, to seventy four years old and counted for the most. Mm, this this table showed the simple characteristics of participants, and next we analyzed the uh, and next we analyzed the differences and graphic characteristics of the three main variables and we found that there are, there are differences in different demographic characteristics of, of each variable as shown in the following table. Mm, in this part, we uh, the correlation analysis the the participants' depression declined with um, with increased social participation, and the depression with uh, with increased physical. Um, for the more a linear regression, the linear regression model was used to test the degree of um, of corre correlation. Um, in addition, we conducted a hierarchical regression analysis of physical mutability as a regulating factor. Um, in this part, we found that physical mutability has a regulation effect in the um, in the in the effect of social participation on the on depression in the elderly in China.
so um, in, in the um, discussion um, based based on the above results we summarized as follows first we can uh, we can provide targeted invitations and prevention measures based on different uh, demographic characteristics and uh, next we believe that in the uh, of adult depression, we should um, maybe we should not only pay attention to the social participation of the elderly, but also strengthen the um, and of chronic diseases. And uh, um, we can we can provide some comprehensive elderly care and public health service. And finally, uh, we point that um, through relatively simple changes in healthcare service, such as the use of joint disease guidelines and uh, targeted screening and prevention, it may be possible to um, greatly improve health and cost outcomes. Um, okay, well, that um, this is a brief report of the service that we have done, and thank you for your listening. Wonderful. Thank you, Wenbo. Um, I think um, you were very efficient with your time, so we have time for a couple of questions. Um, okay. I think maybe if people have questions, they could put them in the chat. Um, uh, because I don't, I don't think our participants can uh, turn on their microphones. Um, okay. So while uh, there is question about depression here is oh do you see a question i didn't see one in the q a yes. panel yes i can see your question and um how depression here is diagnosed um, i think my uh, my measured depression using the classic depression skill uh, such as CESD. And since our data is from a large um, population survey, um, we, are, we are temporarily unable to obtain the depression diagnosis of participants. And um, we hope if, 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 if possible, we hope to include more accurate uh, diagnostic data for Mm, what is, what, mm, for uh, verification analysis in the future. Great, thank you. I can't see the questions myself, but uh, <laughs> I think you are seeing them on the Q&A. Um, are there any other questions there, Winbo? Uh, so, Mishan Lee has a question. How do you define physical multimorbidity? Okay. Um, how, uh, well, um, in our research, we, we defined the multimorbidity presence of two or uh, uh, more physical chronic um, non communicable diseases. We use the term diseases. Uh, we use the term disease to measure physical mutability, uh, including diagnosed uh, hypertension, um, diabetes, chronic lung diseases, and some others. Um, we we counted the number of non communicable diseases for each participant to identify uh, those who had physical mutability. Wenbo. I think um, okay. we'll, we'll move on to the next presentation now. Um, and if we have time at the end for more questions, we can take more questions. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Xuan Yu, uh, also from Lanzhou University. Um, and uh, she will be speaking about uh, a policy brief promotion of elders' economic and social participation with a gender lens in China. Um, Xuan Yu is a PhD candidate at the Evidence-Based Social Sciences Research Center of Lanzhou University. She has a multidisciplinary background in sociology, global health, human resources management, and social welfare. And um, she's participating in numerous uh, global projects. So with that, Xuan Yu, I hope uh, you can share your screen. Actually, no, I can't screen because it's forbidden. 
Okay. Um, I think maybe we will um, request if uh, Wenbo, since you have already presented, could you maybe leave um, the panelist session and um, and uh, return as a participant? Now are you? Oh, able to now I can see. Sorry, wait a moment. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yes, that's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So hello everyone. My name is Xuan and today my presentation topic is an evidence-based policy brief, which we collaborated with the UN Women China to develop and called the promoting economic and social participation of older persons with a gender lens. So if you have any questions or recommendations about our policy brief, we are looking forward to hearing from you. So first, what is the policy brief? As we know, there are different definitions about policy brief. However, according to develop a policy brief, we hope to provide adequate background knowledge to decision makers, policy makers, and related stakeholders. Also, we systematically search and synthesize evidence reflect emergency about priority issues, provide actions or options, and help decision makers to do the evidence-informed decision making. So when we dialogue with different stakeholders several times, and most of people believe that aging is a universal trend in the development of the world's population and a major challenge for China in the 21st century. As the world's largest developing country, the China's population aging level and the future growth rate are significantly higher than the global average, and the challenges it faces are even more daunting. So like in 2020, China's elderly population over 60 years will reach uh, about like 260 million. And in the next five years, the number of people over 60 years will grow at a rate of about like 10 million per year from 2020 to 2050. So like some of those gap, uh, like some models like guess that the gap between the size of China's female population aged 65 and above compared with the men was increased from 10.77 million to 24.636 million. So therefore, uh, we collaborated with the UN Women China to develop an evidence-based policy brief to promote the policy of active aging and gender equality, and to provide suggestions on the economic and social participation of elderly women, as well as an important basis for structuring public policies and actions guidelines for countries suffering from aging. Uh, we mainly used these five steps to develop this evidence-based policy brief. So first, uh, before developing policy brief, we formed a multidisciplinary team, which including methodologists, gender sociologists, policy researchers, public health specialists, program manager, and so on. So each developing members has their own developing group and their rules, as you can see at this table, like the chair of expert or like steering committee, secretary group, evidence synthesis and writing group and external review groups. And we do believe like before we start this policy brief, we ask each one who joined our policy brief and do they have the conflict of interest or not. So next step is confirm priority issues. So because of the COVID-19, we mainly according to three online conference calls and the two rounds brainstorming and the surveys. And at the end, two priority issues, as you can see at the end of the bottom, so like uh, economic participation and social participation were finally identified in our policy brief. So next step, step three is searching, evaluating, and synthesizing. So we developed a search strategy to include evidence from 2000 and 2021. 
this, the language is being mainly English and Chinese literature. So these kinds of the literatures include not only peer-reviewed research evidence, but also policy documents and research reports. So a, to a total of 3,194 articles were searched and screened, and we included 160 documents in our brief at the end. So for the level of evidence, because we included different types of documents and we used our own methods to grade this evidence. So we could find that there are no high level evidence, which is systematic reviews, meta analysis. You can see like we don't have these kinds of the, uh, like the research. And 26% evidence from government or related organizational reports. And 39% of research have correct methods and 34% of documents are reviews, and only one document comes from expert opinion. Uh, when we finish the synthesis evidence, we hold a face-to-face -face and online combination stakeholder dialogue in Beijing, China on July 30, 2021. So in this case, we invited more than 30 related stakeholders or policymakers and decision makers and the researchers to join this dialogue and according to the, our evidence to discuss the policy recommendations and actions at here. So up to now, based on the more than 160 pieces of related documents and stakeholder feedback, uh, as you can see at here, we have formed 11 policy recommendations in these four aspects. So now we invited three external reviewers such as like one policy researcher, one elderly woman, and one decision maker to review our final brief and review according to the reviewer's feedback to edit our final report. And we're launching this report with different languages in the future. So we do believe there are some methodological strengths and limitations in our policy briefs. So this policy brief, we strictly followed the methods of developing evidence-based policy briefs. And before developing brief, we drafted a protocol to make sure the transparency and the scientificity. Then we systematically searched the evidence to reviewers screen the all documents and using the grading tool to evaluate evidence level. Besides, we have written eight representative cases from Europe and the United States, as well as Japan, Korea, and China. So some are from big cities and some are from communities, but we do believe like they can use the, this uh, used as a supplement to this policy brief so that policymakers can better understand the policy recommendations we give. Uh, however, there are some also some limitations in our brief. So first, because only Chinese and English literature were included, there may be language bias, and it is possible that literature published in non-Chinese or English, which is important for our brief, was not included. And the second limitation is that we included literature that is of relatively low quality. So for example, most of the research evidence is observational or service studies. So the strength of their quality may not be high. However, in the social sciences, this is a relatively common situation. So we analyze as deep as possible into, uh, uh, so we into the available evidence and expecting to find as much valuable information as possible. And lastly, some of the evidence or literature that we included whose target population was older adults did not clearly distinguish with it whether it was elderly women or elderly men. Although this literature may help us to form policy recommendations, there may be like indirectness in the evidence. So overall is our like sharing about like our policy briefs. And if you have any questions or recommendations, uh, we are really happy to looking for, forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Xuan Yu. Um, excellent presentation. I, I love the photo of your panel. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> So um, we do have time for one or two questions. I, um, 
you're welcome to write them in the chat or the Q question and answer. Um, maybe uh, while people are thinking, um, can I just ask Xuan Yu, um, did you find uh, gender differences? You mentioned some difficulty in uh, identifying, um, distinguishing between men and women, but did you find differences uh, between, uh, yeah, cross gender? Uh, actually, like we just find about like men and women and we haven't really find about like cross gender in our policy brief, but this is a good like, I think it is a good recommendation and next step we will think about it. Great. Um, are there any other questions for Xuan Yu? I actually can't see the Q&A Xuan Yu, so um, if you see questions. Uh, I can't see any questions in my platform. Okay, great. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll go on to the next speaker. Thank you very much again. And I uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing your report in due course. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Zi Wang. Um, Zi Wang is a graduate student. Um, I think uh, she's just trying to uh, share her screen. So that's great. Thank you. Um, so while you're starting that, uh, Zi Wang is also um, a graduate student from the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine of Lanzhou University. Um, and uh, she will be speaking about high intensity interval training versus moderate intensity continuous training on the prognosis in patients with myocardial infarction, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. And um, in, uh, she's currently with Professor Bin Ma's group um, which has a focus on evaluation uh, and achievement transformation of drugs and medical devices. Zi Wang, I think we do not see your screen yet for your presentation. We see that um, you're there. That is your presentation. And can you make it a presentation view? Uh, yeah. Um, can you see my screen? We see your screen. But we still see the, um, the slides on the left. So I don't know if you can click the uh, in PowerPoint, the presentation view. So we just see your screen, your, the sli one slide at a time. So now that's better there. Uh, but if not, you can proceed like this. It's just uh, we see the font is a little bit small. So um, this is fine. Oh. OK. Um, there. Now, now we see the screen. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank World Works Global Summit for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here to share my research findings with you. Uh, the topic of my speech is um, prognostic impacts of high intensity interval training versus moderate intensity continuous training on patients with myocardial uh, 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 infarction. Uh, I will finish my report from the following four paths, background and the significance of the selected topic, research methods, uh, results, and the future direction. First, background and the significance of the selected topic. In recent years, um, PCI has become the treatment of choice for, my, uh, for myocardial infarction, but PCI and the conventional uh, medications alone are not consistently effective in improving the long-term progn uh, pro prognosis of patients. Over time, exercise-based uh, therapy has gradually evolved as an important method for secondary prevention of my, uh, myocardial infection. This is mainly attributed, attributed to exercise therapy mediated delay in the progression of um, atherosclerosis um, decrease in the uh, incidence of advanced um, uh, car, uh, car uh, cardi cardiac events, reduction in the rate of re uh, hospitalization and uh, mortality, uh, improvement in exercise tolerance and quality of life. 
In 2017, the World Health Organization identified exercise therapy as one of the best value interventions in a report on cardiovascular disease. However, the implementation of exercise therapy in clinical practice remains controversial, particularly with, with regard to the intensity of exercise rehabilitation uh, rehabilitation measures that should be taken to ensure maximum ben uh, benefit for uh, uh, for myocardial infection patients. Thus, the present study presented a, systema a systematic review with uh, meta-analysis to assess the effects of high-intensity interval training on the prog uh, prognosis of myocardial infection when compared to moderate intensity continuous training. Second methods. Um, electronic databases were searched for relevant studies published up to journey 2021, particularly to investig uh, investigators uh, include uh, recommend the controlled trials that uh, assign the, uh, the effect of high intensity interval training on the, prog uh, on the prognosis of myocardial infection patients as compared to moderate intensity continuous training according to the defined inclusion and exclusion criteria. The risk of biases for the included studies was assigned according to the Cochrane recommend version 1, and data synthesis was performed using Riemann file point for software. Um, three results. In this article, we draw three important conclusions. Firstly, the increase of peak oxygen uptake in high-intensity interval training group was significantly higher than that in moderate intensity continuous training group after intervention. Secondly, heat would aid in significant improved, uh, improvement in patients' subsistence rate. Lastly, heat has higher security than moderate intensity continuous training. Although the present uh, systematic review demonstrated the superiority of heat exercise for myocardial infection pa uh, patients in um, clinical situations, um, uh, the, applic the applicability and, uh, and feasibility of heat in the real world need to be further validated by more uh, prospective original studies. In the recent uh, clinical research settings, there is a lack of uniform standard of uh, free work for heat, uh, for heat uh, implementation protocols, particularly in terms of intensity, uh, uh, frequency, frequency, duration, or specific exercise criteria for myocardial infection uh, patients, depending on their condition. All these factors limit the translation of HATA to the real world. Uh, that's all. Thanks, uh, thanks for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Ziwang. Um, we do have time for one or two questions. That was uh, very concise. Um, so there's a question from Howard White. Can you please describe the difference between high and moderate intensity? Um, Okay. Um, how, and he adds, how did, how did you determine it from the papers? And Zi Wang, you could um, stop sharing your screen now, I think. No. <laughs> there, perfect. So yeah, so um, question um, about how you defined moderate and high intensity. Uh, in comparison to this high intensity interval training over significantly uh, uh, the shortcomings associated with uh, um, MICT, uh, particularly the short duration and uh, uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic nature of exercise uh, make uh, HIIT more pro uh, uh, more promo <laughs> um Additional, uh, it has been um, previously shown that uh, 
uh, heat uh, can significantly improve pe uh, patients' physical fitness and uh, uh, functions and uh, reduce the risk of uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, disease in a short period as compared to MICT. Mm. Okay, thank you. So the, um, uh, the duration and the intensity. Uh, there's another question um, from John Atagetko um, about the size of the effect for your intervention on the outcome. Can you comment on that, D. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, the one question, how did you determine the things from the people? Uh, uh, I think you have answered that one, Zhu Wang. I think you could go on to Janet to get the question about the effect size. How, how big was the effect size for uh, high intensity compared to moderate intensity on the, um, the outcomes of interest? Uh, this is a systematic, uh, uh, systematic review. Um, uh, we We don't take any intervention. We um, we take uh, some RCT research. Yes, and um, when you use meta-analysis to look at the effect of um, uh, the high-intensity exercise on your um, your primary outcomes, um, did you assess? Uh, how much bigger was the effect for the high intensity compared to moderate? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, wait, uh, 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 over uh, uh, 300, uh, about 300. Uh, uh, the present study presented an overview of nine RCTs. All these studies were published after 20, uh, 25 and involved that a total of uh, 364. Patients. Uh, Great, thank you. Um, I think maybe in the interest of uh, time, we should move on to the last presentation. Um, uh, thank you, Z Wang, for your presentation. And I think um, those who are interested can follow up directly with you for more details. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. So, um, so the last presenter is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Gugumu. Um, uh, Dr. Gugumu is uh, going to present an uh, evidence of the um, plan for an evidence and gap map on digital interventions to reduce social isolation and loneliness among older adults. Um, uh, Elizabeth has over 15 years experience in systematic review methods and evidence synthesis. Um, she comes um, uh, with experience from the Cochrane Collaboration and also Campbell uh, and um, uh, graduated as a medical doctor in 1990 from the University of Yagawindi, Cameroon and also has a Master of Science in Public Health from Oxford Brookes University, uh, UK in 2005. So, uh, Elizabeth, I can see that you've managed to share your slides. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> so my presentation is about uh, 
digital interventions to reduce social isolation and loneliness among older adults. And why are we interested in social isolation and loneliness? Well, the World Health Organization identified social isolation and loneliness as a priority issue to tackle as part of the decade of healthy aging. And social isolation and loneliness are related, but they are two distinct concepts. Well, social isolation is the lack of um, social connections with other people, while loneliness is the negative feelings about social connections with others. The prevalence ranges from 5 to 43, depending on the study and the region. They pose a significant concern because of serious impact on older people's well-being, mental health, physical health, and longevity. And they have been aggravated by the lockdown and social distancing measures during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the objective of our uh, project is to create an evidence and gap map that will be used to identify areas of evidence as well as any gaps in research related to using digital interventions to reduce social isolation and loneliness among older adults. We know that older adults experience different needs and they require health and social support that can be provided through social connections and network. And these are some of the different needs that they experience. And some risk factors of social isolation and loneliness are major changes in life that could cause change or loss of social network, for example, bereavement, living alone, impaired mobility, impaired cognition, limited income, societal factors, and the physical environment. Social isolation and loneliness may be caused by multiple factors at the same time, and people respond differently depending on their age and coping skills. And based on the identified risks and needs, tailored support can be provided to the socially isolated and lonely individuals through digital technology. And these digital interventions are of interest because they can be remotely delivered, especially now during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we use the PICO framework to define the components of the evidence for the gap map. And we developed a conceptual framework through a consultative process with stakeholders and adaptation of existing frameworks. We initially considered a refined version of the World Health Organization classification of digital health interventions framework. This framework was developed to categorize different ways in which digital and mobile technologies are used to support healthcare. And then we uh, organized the digital interventions based on the target primary users, clients, and health and social care providers. And those are the different uh, interventions that could be used. And so we had the stakeholder consultation meeting with representatives of key organizations, policymakers, and academics, and discuss this uh, framework with them. And they found that the interventions were more focused on healthcare, and they suggested uh, a need for a more user-intuitive typology of interventions, which could be needs-based. And they also suggested that we include uh, citizens in the framework development. So we identified two other frameworks and adapted them to develop our conceptual framework. And the framework based on the risk factors and the needs of the older people, services could be provided through digital technology, and there are four different categories of interventions. Interventions to improve social skills, to enhance social interactions, to enhance social support, and interventions for social cognitive training. And depending on the circumstances and the risks and the needs, multiple component approaches could be used. These interventions work through different ways and the outcomes are measured at different levels. 
you know, have individual outcomes, societal outcomes, and process indicators. So we had um, focus groups with citizens where we discussed the new framework that I just showed and then a draft of what the map could include. And then the citizens suggested that they would like to see coding for interventions related to the need of finding purpose in later life. They would like that the map should capture interventions related to recreation and physical activity. And they wanted to see affordability and access to technology as outcomes. And so we worked on that again and then came up with the eligibility criteria for the program and also developed a search strategy. And these are the databases that uh, we have searched so far, 10 of them, with no date or language restrictions from insertion. And the search strategy came up with 15,000 records and we screened 9,600 titles and abstracts after deduplication. And we have been able to include um, 212 studies so far, 77 systematic reviews and 135 primary studies. And we intend to screen the references of the systematic reviews as well to see if we could find any additional primary studies that were missed in the electronic searches. And we have tested the coding in, because we're using AP Reviewer for this project. We have tested the coding and this is a draft of what the map might look like later on when the project is completed. And so we have like low and critical Kind of low quality reviews. We also have some randomized control trials, and we have a high quality review for now that we have mapped for now. So, we'll thank you and we'll welcome all your input into this project as we continue to work on it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gaguma. Um, so I think you can take back your screen, um, yeah. probably, mm -hmm. and um, I just um, welcome questions um, from uh, the participants. Uh, they can be put either in the chat or in the Q and A. And I'm just checking; I don't see any. So. Um, I could just ask one question in the interim. Uh, there is um, a poster in the poster session on engagement of uh, stakeholders and citizens in um, uh, really uh, empowering citizens in mapping uh, to help define the map. So I guess my question is, can you comment a bit on um, how the map changed after um, consulting with citizens and the public? Sure. Um, when we first um, set up the map, uh, we had like broad uh, broad categories for the interventions and. Uh, the outcomes and with the contributions from the citizens, we decided to break down those broad categories so that uh, uh, more uh, interventions will show up, especially those that they were interested to see. And we also separated some of the uh, outcomes so that we, like we had um, cost as one outcome that we separated it to have cost effectiveness and affordability, for example, so that the outcomes that the citizens were interested in would be seen when they look at the map. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. 
So I think um, given this panel started late, um, I will uh, endeavor to finish by 11 today. So uh, um, I'd like to thank all the panelists again. Um, the Campbell Aging Group is, uh, is really um, growing. We've had almost 10 new title registrations this year. Um, and uh, really encourage all of you uh, who participated today to um, uh, keep following uh, Campbell Aging. And uh, thank you again to all the panelists for your excellent presentations. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>